Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I know you all have really enjoyed the cookie and coffee break. Um, and I want to invite you all to return to your seats. And in a few moments, uh, we're going to start our next panel. Our panelists are actually on the stage here with us. So I want to invite you all to... Okay. Okay, great. I think we're just going to start, if that's okay. Um, if the folks who are in the back, just grab your coffee and um, just if folks could keep uh, the conversation um, quiet now. <laughs> Throughout the day today, we have heard many of the panelists and participants reference the acute need for legal representation for those who are in immigration detention. Some have referred to the fact that individuals who are represented move through the system more efficiently, um, and also the difference that legal counsel can make in cases. We're going to have an opportunity to explore those points in greater depth during our next panel. Our, our closing session right now is focused on finding effective counsel and looks at lessons learned from the criminal justice field, um, but also how, how do we address these challenges in the context of immigration detention and hopefully a little bit at this moment um, of potential comprehensive immigration reform. We have an amazing moderator today, Karen Grisset. Karen is known to many of you. She's the public service counsel at Freed Frank um, and has handled many, many pro bono cases during her, her legal career. Ken Mayu, assistant professor of professional practice at Louisiana State University. Next to him, we have Jonathan Ryan, the executive director of RAICES, which is Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services from San Antonio, Texas. We also have Juan Asuna, known to many of you all, the director of the Executive Office for Immigration Review at the U.S. Department of Justice. We really appreciate Judge Asuna making the time to come over here today and um, share uh, with you his um, observations, hopefully a few statistics, um, and his insights as always. Uh, we also are really lucky to have Brianna Mir Mirchief with us today. Brianna is a deputy federal public defender from Los Angeles uh, who's here to give us a perspective, perspective from the criminal justice world. So thank you all, and thank you, Karen. I'll turn the panel over to you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes here to tee up the access to counsel topic, just in case it hasn't been teed up uh, enough in the earlier panels. Um, I think everybody here is aware that the impact of detention on access to counsel is a very important issue, not, an, uh, not a new one, certainly a very timely one, uh, continuing today. More than 25 years ago, when the construction of the detention center at Oakdale was contemplated, there was litigation asserting that the isolated location for a detention facility uh, would lead to the inability to access counsel. And while that wasn't successful, much of the predictions from that litigation, I think, are widely recognized to be true. Numerous studies and reports confirm that the mere fact of detention matters. The rate of representation for detainees is vastly different of that for non-detained persons. Brittany mentioned in one of the earlier panels this morning that uh, some statistical data indicating that only 16% of detainees are represented in the immigration courts. And in the ABA 2010 study, uh, the data was similar. 16% of detainees represented and about 57 to 60% of non detained at that time. And I hope that when we get to Director Asuna, he'll be able to give us some updated data uh, on that point. We hope that the statistics now are a bit better in response to some recent efforts, but the contrast is still pretty stark. And in turn, the question of whether a person has representation or not, we also know, affects outcomes. The same ABA study citing work done at Georgetown shows that grants of asylum occur at a rate of 45% if an individual is represented versus 16% if not. 
And the recent work coming out of the Katzman study group in New York showed that overall, a person was more likely to obtain relief, five times more likely, if represented, uh, and specifically, 18% with counsel win, generally, speaking of detainees, and only 3% of detainees win some form of relief if not represented. Um, but nevertheless, most of the time, uh, government agencies still are locating detention facilities in largely remote, largely rural locations. Um, this has an impact on pro bono representation. I can say as a manager of a major law firm pro bono practice that the fact of the, the remoteness of those locations impacts the ability to recruit pro bono lawyers. Number one, that's three to four hours each direction, uh, generally speaking, of time, just driving time to go to and from the facility. So that is a hardship for volunteer lawyers, particularly where it's, it's not only a matter of committing the time, but it's non-productive time in a legal sense. They may be willing to devote 50 or 100 or 200 hours to representation, but if every trip to visit with their client consumes an eight or 10 or more hours in uh, driving, uh, going to Roy Rogers or whatever, that um, cuts significantly into the time that they can afford to commit. And in this time of uh, the economic downturn and decreased headcounts in law firms coupled with increasing pressures for billable hours, the hours that those volunteer lawyers can commit out of what's a decreasing pool for pro bono are precious. And when given the choice between a detained and a non-detained case, uh, hours wasted driving the car um, are really difficult. And then we talk about places like uh, New York or other major urban centers where most lawyers don't even have cars, then getting to the rural centers is even more of a problem. So you have time, but the expense also. I've heard people talking about having to rent a car, you know, hire a driver for eight hours to go from New York to upstate New York or something to take a case. So those are all considerations that directly impact the availability of pro bono. So the goal of this panel is going to be to take much of what we learned in the regional dialogues on access to counsel around the country and talk about what those local experiences um, tell us about national trends, where the problems are, where the successes are, and where we might go from here uh, to solve this problem at a national level. What can be done better? Who can or should do it? Who should pay for it? Uh, what's the role of government? And where do legal service providers and private lawyers fit into this picture? Uh, so Ken, I think we'll, with that, we'll start with you, um, taking those ideas as a starting point. What do you see in Louisiana? What are your experiences? And what can you share with us in terms of views on the national access to counsel problem? Um, as you may have heard just uh, at the end of the last panel, I'm a clinical professor at LSU. I run an immigration clinic at the LSU Law School. Uh, and I'm here with my uh, colleague, Hiroko Kusuda, who runs an immigration clinic at Loyola Law School. So we have the two immigration clinics in our state. Um, and uh, Hiroko and I broke our usual rule, which is we traveled together here, and we're traveling home together. Uh, we don't like to do that because we would wipe out, you know, the entire nonprofit bar if the plane went down. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, for the interest of convenience and it's an opportunity for us to visit together, we travel together. Um, things are a lot better in Louisiana than they were just a few years ago. Um, we do have more uh, nonprofit attorneys than we did just uh, six years ago when Hiroko was the only nonprofit attorney in Louisiana. Um, but there are still some extremely difficult challenges in Louisiana. Um, I, I always think that, you know, oh, the, my experience with this just m must be unique. I mean, Oakdale must not be so different from other places, surely. Um, but as I've gotten to know this business as I've gotten to meet with other people, um, I'm convinced that Oakdale really is a very different kind of place. 
uh, different from many of the other uh, contexts in which detention and um, immigration removal proceedings are held. And uh, a friend of my uh, colleague, Peter Markowitz, wrote uh, an article called Deportation is Different and Advocating for the Right to Counsel Because of the Special um, Consequences of Deportation. Well, Oakdale is different. Um, Oakdale was born in crisis, okay? In the early 80s, the Mariel Boat left, uh, the Central American Civil Wars, this great influx of people, and INS responded, the government responded, and quickly built a number of detention centers. And they were all built where you would expect them to be built. South Texas, South Arizona, Chrome was built in Florida. Um, these facilities were quickly thrown together. And then Oakdale. Oakdale is, is in many ways, it's a, it's a first of many different kinds. It was the first of its kind to be completely unconnected with flows of migration. It was the first of its kind to be extremely far from any of the regular kind of immigration law infrastructure, if you will. Um, it was the first of its kind, uh, as I say, it was built on the uh, economic development model. It was the first time it was a community that lobbied hard to get this. It was a community down on its luck and saw this as a way to revitalize their community. It was the first, um, it was the first detention center that was burned down. <laughs> uh, two years after it was opened, the Cubans uh, rioted there and burned down a large part of the facility. Uh, but, but it rose again from the ashes, proving that once you have one of these places, it's really hard to stop using them. Um, and it was also a first in that uh, then and today, the Federal Bureau of Prisons that operates Oakdale claims that they are not subject to immigration detention standards, especially the standards mandating access for Know Your Rights programs uh, and the standards mandating special access for counsel. And so we still struggle today uh, with the Oakdale detention facility um, being this place that has special obstacles um, to access to counsel. Oakdale is um, still very different. Um, as I was preparing for this talk, um, and as I did several years ago, I started looking at the numbers. Um, in fact, I've made a FOIA request. I'd, I'd like to really study the numbers more significantly. But if you just take uh, EOIR's, EOIR's own statistical reports, annual reports, you'll find out that Oakdale has one of the lowest rates of applications for relief. This is the rate at which people ask to stay in the United States of all of the immigration courts in the United States. In 2011, in fiscal year 2011, Oakdale had the highest caseload of any court in the United States. 18,000 matters were completed in, among the three judges at Oakdale. That's 6,000 ma matters apiece among the three judges at Oakdale. And it's interesting to see that as caseloads go up, the application rates go down. And in the paper I've put on, out on the table, you can see the graphs of EOI's own data. As caseloads ramped up, the rates of application went down. As the caseloads leveled off and came down, the rates of application went up. So you see this perfect linear relationship between, maybe not perfect, but this apparent linear relationship between caseloads um, and uh, the application rates. And why this is important is that uh, you just can't reasonably expect that the same three judges who were handling a docket of four or 5,000 cases a year prior to the big run up, um, and they had uh, application rates of around 15 to 17% that those same three judges are going to handle 18,000 cases um, with the same results. It's just something's got to give. And while I don't propose to understand you know, why it's happening, uh, but when you see the outcome, uh, it, something's wrong. Something's wrong that four years before, uh, there was a much higher application rate than there is today. And of course, 
Oakdale is not alone. Um, this idea of putting uh, detention centers out in the middle of nowhere um, has been replicated and now two detention centers, Oakdale and Stewart, account for almost 15% of all detained completions in the United States. Uh, and they also, by the way, have the lowest application rates in the United States. So when you put people out in the middle of nowhere and make it difficult for them to access counsel, they end up not asking for relief as often. And, you know, it turns out to be a pretty efficient um, system of moving people from inside of this country to outside of this country. But the question, you know, as we were talking about values this morning, is, is are we going to value efficiency at the cost of justice? Are we going to, uh, you know, value efficiency at the cost of recognizing that this individual who, you know, has possibly a way to stay in the United States should have an opportunity to make that claim and have it heard in a reasonable manner by um, an immigration judge. So um, there are these structural issues um, at Oakdale and largely just kind of the throughput that's being forced. And of course, this isn't a decision that, you know, Mr. Osuna made um, that uh, to put a, a court there, it's a decision that I says, well, we're going to have a bunch of detention centers in Louisiana, and we're going to have to have an immigration court to process people. Um, another interesting uh, kind of statistic to throw out uh, is um, I asked the American Immigration Lawyers Association to give me anonymous membership data, and they did. They gave me a, a code, a zip coded file of all of the um, ALA members in the United States. And uh, I spent some time trying to figure out how to do statistical things and uh, was able to crunch the numbers. And I can tell you now, you know, how many lawyers there are within 50 miles of every um, detention center. And lo and behold, it turns out that uh, Oakdale and Stewart have the lowest numbers of lawyers <laughs> within 50 miles of those detention centers. Um, within. it really shouts out to you. And then you compare that with a place like Elizabeth, New Jersey, which of course has 1,660 lawyers within 50 miles. Uh, and you know, miraculously, they have uh, uh, an application rate of around 17, 18% per year. And of course, they're right, you know, they're in New York, there's all kinds of resources there. There's, um, I believe they have an LOP program. Um, and they don't have an LOP program. Well, notwithstanding not having an LOP program, they, they do pretty well. Uh, although I think 17% is, you know, I wouldn't make that my target, uh, you know, for uh, the number of people that I, I would hope would uh, be able to make an application for relief. Um, so there's this kind of overarching structural issue of putting people out in the middle of nowhere and expecting that you're going to have a just um, result. Uh, there are some very specific burdens on due process. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one is access to Know Your Rights programs. Uh, and Oakdale, uh, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, feels that it is not subject to the detention standards. And so uh, since 2004, we have been completely shut out of Oakdale. And the way detention is structured in Louisiana is that all of the detainees are sent to the two biggest facilities. And so um, LaSalle, which thank thankfully has um, an LOP program, uh, they get most of the detainees. And then the second biggest is Oakdale. And this management practice of putting people, uh, the most people possible in Oakdale means that they uh, preclude the greatest number of people from access to any kind of Know Your Rights um, information. Um, my colleague Kuroko and I, we do monthly um, Know Your Rights programs at the two smaller facilities. Um, but sometimes, I know the, particularly the facility that Hiroko goes to, they use as an overflow, 
overflow facility. So you might go and see only 30 people when we know that there's 850 people every single day. There are 850 people at Oakdale. Um, and if someone's fighting their case and it looks like they're going to spend more time in, the de in detention, they send them to Oakdale. Now, Oakdale, I'll say, you know, as in my experience, is a, a well-run facility. Um, and they have good standards in terms of medical care and things like that. So I don't get complaints from people about the way that Oakdale is run. But in terms of access to counsel, it leaves a tremendous amount to be desired. Um, which is my next point, is that um, access to counsel is very difficult um, both at LaSalle and at Oakdale, and those are the two biggest facilities. Um, the national detention standards require uh, that the facilities provide telephone access to counsel, that at any time a detainee may request um, a telephone conference um, with his attorney. And the way this works at the other two, the smaller detention facilities, is that I write a letter that says, I want to speak with these three detainees, and I'm going to call you tomorrow at 10 AM. And if you have a problem with that, please let me know. And the next day at 10 AM, I call the facility, and they have my clients ready, and I talk to my clients, and it's wonderful. The way it works at LaSalle is that I have to call LaSalle, and I have to have the detention facility leave a message for my client who doesn't speak English. To have my client request, make a written request to her case manager. To request a phone call with her attorney. Two days later, if I'm lucky, the case manager will call me and say, Mr. Mayo, your client you know, requested a phone call. Uh, more often than not, it doesn't happen that way. Now, the national detention standards say that if the facility insists that the detainee initiate the request, and they do this to cut down on lawyers churning, right? Uh, then the lawyer has to be allowed to facilitate the, phone, uh, the request. Um, but the practice at LaSalle is that I can't send a letter with a signed G28 to have a, a conference with my client. The practice at Oakdale is um, a little bit more brazen. Um, at Oakdale, you're not allowed to send a letter or an email. Uh, you must make a phone call. And the way that Oakdale thwarts access to counsel is simply by not answering the phone. And so my students call for days on end. Uh, I have gotten emails and uh, calls from pro bono lawyers in New York and in Washington, DC. Please tell me how I can get in contact with my client at Oakdale uh, because they don't answer the phone. And, uh, and so because I'm one of the privileged few, I tell them, oh, no, no, no. You have to know the special number. You have to know the special number. And that after that phone answers, you know, and they say, you know, hit zero if this is a call for an inmate, uh, don't, don't hit zero hit 4,000. And if you hit 4,000, you're going to get <laughs> a, an operator um, who's going to take your client's name and A number and is going to send that phone and then give that message to um, a counselor who, if you're lucky, is going to call you back in three or four days or not. And so uh, it's extremely frustrating um, and you can imagine that if I was going to ask uh, an attorney, let's say from New Orleans, to help on a complicated case uh, and say, well, at least you can talk to your client by phone. You know, you don't have to do every single uh, conference in person. Well, no, that's not the way it plays out on the ground. And so 90% of the detainees are in the most remote and most difficult to access facilities um, in Louisiana. Um, anyway, I've, I've got some other proposals for reform, and when we get to that part of the discussion, um, we'll talk about that. But, but Oakdale is different. Oakdale is different from other places, um, but it also speaks to the need for transparency and oversight of places like LaSalle, like Oakdale, 
um, like Stuart, Georgia. Um, they're far away from the eyes and ears of attorneys and people who are just coming in and out of the system. Um, it's a positive thing, you know, having more attorneys walking in and into an immigration court, walking into detention centers, calling their clients and finding out what's going on, um, it brings a, that brings a level of accountability. That brings a level of transparency. Um, but what happens in places like Oakdale is that, you know, there are very few voices that get heard. Um, there are the, the complaints, you know, while the occasional complaints are made, I can tell you that here I am, you know, six years of asking for um, access for Know Your Rights at Oakdale and have never been granted access in six years. So um, as we begin a discussion about um, comprehensive immigration reform, you know, one of the most important things in my book in our little part of the world is some kind of consistent access uh, to counsel and some real transparency and accountability for those standards for access. Thank you, Ken. I want to ask you two very short questions. Uh, one is, you talked about the relationship between the immigration judge's caseload and the applications for relief, but I wanted to ask, do you know what the representation rate is overall in Louisiana and how that compares to the national level? Yeah, um, it's, it's right on that par, uh, as, as I understand it. The, the only year that I saw the numbers actually for Oakdale was uh, the 2011 numbers, uh, which was part of Lenny Benson's report, and it was, I think it was at 13%. All right. So, which which corresponds roughly with the um, national level yeah, for a little detained. a little less, but similar. Yeah. And the other question is, what about the population at Oakdale? Is there anything particular about criminal history or otherwise that makes the likelihood of viable applications for relief um, down in the way that you've identified? I mean, among the the population that we see, you know, in our know your rights programs, I, I don't see anything that would indicate that. And not, not for that consistently over years. I mean, we're talking about from 2006 forward, uh, the rate of application has been substantially lower than it was just three years before. Um, now, again, all of this bears study, and, um, and I hope, you know, people, uh, will begin to do that study. I'm, I'm hoping to do some of that work uh, to look at not just Oakdale, but across the board, what, what does it mean in terms of outcomes when people are put into detention? Um, what is the likelihood? And, and what are some of the things that are causing these lower application rates and lower um, representation rates? Thank you. And Jonathan, now turning to you, what do you see from your perch at Raices in Texas? What, how are your issues the same or different from those that Ken has identified? Brother. <laughs> <laughs> Did I steal uh, all your thoughts? Yeah, we, well, we live, we live kind of isolated lives doing the work we do, so it's, it's rare that we get into a, a, a kind of such close contact with other people and who share such uh, what we think are unique experiences. But um, now my name is Jonathan. I'm here because I got on the wrong bus. Uh, uh, it was December of 2002, and I was a first-year law student trying to figure out why in the world I had gone to law school, a frustrated uh, English major. And I was attempting to take a casual uh, trip to meet my family in central Mexico for a Christmas holiday. And I failed to get on the Greyhound bus for which I had purchased a ticket because it was full. This was in Austin, Texas, and it had been full from Dallas. And a uh, little note to everybody, if the bus is full, I don't stop. So I found that out about an hour after my bus should have picked me up. So after fustering around for a few hours, I realized that there was a bus that left from the other side of town, uh, outside of a taco stand in East Austin, and that really serviced more of the Mexican national population who were returning home. So I kind of left my cohorts of backpackers with Canadian flags on the back, uh, uh, for, for this new group, and uh, at about 11 p.m. we got on the bus. I remember my eyes opening. I'm a good sleeper. I think that was another problem. Uh, my eyes opened briefly, I think, seeing a line of red lights, which I assumed was the line to get across the Laredo port of entry. And the next thing I remembered, it was daylight, and I was rocking and rolling 
along in the bus somewhere between Laredo and Mexico City. Uh, I realized when I got off the bus that I had not gone through any kind of immigration checkpoint, which I had done routinely. I knew, I knew the rigmarole, uh, but I, I presumed that since I was, on a, I was the only non-Mexican on the bus that we just got waved in in the busyness of the, the evening. So I, I went to Mexico. I, I arrived at my destination and spoke to someone in the U.S. consulate who gave me some great advice that it wasn't a problem. I just get on the bus and go home uh, at the end of my trip and pay my $50 on the way out. It's not exactly how it worked out for me. Um, I did have a wonderful time in Mexico and I got on the bus to come home two days before law school started back up under strict instructions that every day late was a letter grade off. And I got an hour and a half into my bus ride and we were stopped in uh, the mountains. This is not sunny beach Mexico. This is cold, mountainous, rainy Mexico. And uh, we went through a federales checkpoint. I, was, I had $200 in my shoe just in case. Uh, I was whipped off the bus and no opportunity to extract the $200. My bag was waiting for me. The door to the bus hit me uh, and drove off. And I was there with uh, some dudes with very big guns and uh, put into a bus. And I was the first person who was put into the little mini bus. Uh, and uh, so I just hunkered down. Uh, over the course of hours that I was there, uh, eventually the door opened again and a family of, I think, uh, Brazilians were, were put into the bus with us, and they were being followed by a Mexican gentleman who appeared to be advocating on their behalf. I did not speak Spanish at this time. And uh, he appeared to be kept swept up in the uh, act of advocating for this family that he must have gotten to know on the bus, and he looked over and saw me. And it's like his eyes doubled in size, uh, you know, frying pan to fire. And he said in English, what are you doing here? <laughs> what is your name? And can I help you? And that memory, it, 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 it's lodged in my brain like a diamond. I will never forget that man. I will never forget that I went from being, I'm an immigrant, I'm from Ireland, but I've been here all my life. So I, I got the best immigrant experience that America had to offer. And for the first time in my life, I had fallen into a deep hole that my daddy and mommy couldn't help me with. And this man, he, he, he said those three words to me. He spoke to me in English. And then the door was slammed. I was able to utter the names of my parents, the, where they were, and the door slammed. Uh, it, it, I, I only bring this up because it's not an access to counsel issue. He was just some guy, as far as I know. But we've, we've spoken today about uh, humanity and about the humanness of this issue. And I, I think that it's, uh, for me, going from a person who did not know, I knew in about three seconds why I'd gone to law school and what I was going to do. And uh, returned, uh, thank God, I was there. It was, it was a Disneyland ride of a detention compared to some of the stories that we've heard today. And I was out in 48 hours, and I made my contracts class in time to, to not, not get a worse grade than I already got. Um, <laughs> but I immediately enrolled in the immigration clinic at University of Texas and began what is now a nonstop life of, of working in immigration detention. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I kind of bring that up because um, it, almost to a person, everybody who I know who does this kind of work has some similar experience, either personal or through uh, a family member or a friend that has so moved them that they will stick at it. Um, the, the purpose of our discussion here is access to counsel. Uh, and I, I just, you know, after making all these notes, I, I kind of just had one phrase that, that I think is, is meaningful. It's to increase access to counsel, you must reduce obstacles and increase incentives. Uh, you know, if we want to get people engaged in this work, we have to make it possible and somehow interesting. For those of us who have had these meaningful, life-changing experiences, we'll stick at it. We'll jump over the hurdles. We'll try to break through the walls. Um, but you cannot have a system that depends on people like that to to, 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 to keep it moving. Um, uh, where I currently work in central Texas, um, you were asking Ken earlier, where's the lawyers near Carnes? Hi, that's me. Um, <laughs> um, I, um, I began in uh, uh, professionally working in this field in 2005 at an agency now known as American Gateways, and that's a, an LOP location. Uh, uh, for about a year, the first year, we did not have the LOP funding and traveled to the South Texas Detention Complex, uh, Pearsall, we also heard about that, which uh, incidentally is located where a Japanese internment camp was during the Second World War. Um, and uh, it, it's a facility that houses up to, I believe, uh, 1,908 individuals. 
Um, and it is located about one hour outside of, of San Antonio. Um, it, uh, I have waited uh, as many as four hours to visit with a detainee once arrived at the facility. It is in the blueprint that only so many people can get through. Uh, and, and so these are things that really we cannot change uh, uh, now that the building is up. So I think someone else brought up the issue of procurement. And I, I think, and this was something in the development of the Carnes facility. We did have uh, meetings with some of the architects and they did come down and we were given a chance uh, at that point to voice concerns about, I mean, we saw the blueprints uh, for, that, for that place. And I will get to Carnes as well. Um, uh, the Pearsall facility currently has immigration judges. That's a recent novation. Um, they had two, now they've just added a third. And that, it, for those who are opposed to televideo, asylum hearings, is, is certainly a benefit. Um, uh, and I'm sure, I think it's a benefit that an immigration judge is in the room with the respondent. I, I think that that's critical. Um, even at the master hearing stage, not just at the individual stage, but just so that they can see a person in the room, potentially again and again, um, and, and feel that presence of the mass of, of people. Um, one, one thing I would bring up, however, is that when you have a detained docket at a facility that's an hour outside of the city where the non-detained docket is, both judges, you may have a hearing on the same day with in two locations at 8.30. And judges are very, rightfully so, they're very jealous of their calendars. They want to move the cases quickly. And so uh, what this has resulted in is, I think, a decrease in the representation, even private representation, at, at the South Texas detention complex because you just have to, again, go back to reduce obstacles and increase incentives. If you're a, a private attorney and you need to make a choice between going out to the detention center or taking a non-detained case, you're going to get a non-detained case setting months in advance. If you take a, non a detained case, you're going to be on the periodicity of every three weeks, every two weeks having a hearing, and your long-standing non-detained clients are obviously going to take preference. So we've definitely seen a disincentive for even private attorneys to take cases out of the South Texas detention complex because they can't be in two places at once. Really, it, it, it disfavors non-for-profits, it disfavors solo attorneys, and really puts the, the game with the, the larger firms who can afford to, who have the manpower to spread their, their, their resources across multiple locations. Um, now, um, the Carnes Detention Center, we also, um, uh, uh, thanks to uh, recent funding from the Lutheran Immigrant Refugee Services, are participating in a project to reach out to um, detained survivors of torture. And I have had occasion to travel to Carnes on many occasions and spent time there doing Know Your Rights. Um, it is true, it is the only place to be detained. Uh, it, I would be detained nowhere else. Um, <laughs> Uh, however, it is different from the South Texas detention complex in that it is a, it's a credible fear only detention site. That is to say that individuals are there until they receive a determination of their credible fear or reasonable fear hearing upon that uh, if they receive a positive uh, uh, response, then ICE confirms that they have an itinerary, uh, a place to go, an address to go, and they are cut loose. So that is a non-240 uh, proceedings. There is no immigration court proceedings, aside from cre uh, credible fear reviews, uh, that take place at that facility. Um, and uh, uh, it does not have an LOP, although it is the uh, uh, model uh, detention center for the moment. It does not have uh, LOP funding. And um, uh, to, to move from facilities to the LOP, for those who aren't uh, intimately aware, this is a system that funds uh, non-for-profit attorneys to go to the facilities to provide a Know Your Rights presentation, individual screenings. They will do group workshops for pro se in, uh, applicants to help them to fill out their own applications and attempt to match them with a pro bono. Um, uh, there is evidence that where there are LOPs, there are fewer applications for relief presented. There are, uh, because a main role as we do when we uh, go on the LOP is to, is to explain to people that they are not in many cases eligible for relief. Um, so the I increase of LOP funding I think is critical uh, uh, in, in the process towards greater access to counsel. And we've, we we've strongly urge that there's increased uh, 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 funding for those programs to be deployed na nationwide. Um, but that only gets us halfway there. The LOP depends on the presence of pro bono representatives to complete the, 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 the cycle, 
the, to actually provide some meaning to the information that you're given to the uh, 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 pro se workshops. And with all of the barriers that I went through before, it's extremely difficult, nigh impossible to truly get a non-for-profit or to get a, a pro bono presence in any meaningfully, meaningful way. You may get an attorney from time to time, but it, the obstacles are great. They'll take, a, they'll take a case and they'll check the box that they've done their, you know, they, they go through the gauntlet and they, they don't return with great frequency. Um, now, LOP needs more than just the change of, a, of a, an interpretation of law, removing the restriction to become effective. If tomorrow that restriction was removed and those who are now allowed to go to the facilities to meet with people are now mandated to represent everyone, we're going from a bad situation to a worse situation. I think that right now there are two or three attorneys funded to go to Pearsall. Two or three attorneys to 2,000 people is woefully inadequate. So, I mean, we start with access, like I experienced in, in, in my little uh, 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 my own personal experience, we move to access to counsel, we must have access to effective counsel. And in order for that to occur, we have to have sufficient funding to make these meaningful uh, representatives. And I, I think in the public defender model, we might hear more about that. Um, with many facilities, I think also post-release services are important. That's the second half to detention is getting out. Uh, with Carnes, I would mention, for example, you are released from Carnes, you'll go to New Jersey, but your NTA will then be filed in San Antonio. And so without the knowledge that you must, perform, you must uh, submit certain paperwork, you must return if, that paper, if you don't receive a confirmation that your change of venue or your change of address has been approved, it's very likely that people will be removed in their absentia. And so it's critical as well as we consider the access to counsel in detention that the effects of, de of detention, the ramifications continue after the release due to the, the different logistical processes that are put into motion while you're in the center. So um, I, I would wrap up there. Um, uh, we, we currently work in the uh, unaccompanied minors realm quite extensively. I do think now those shelters are managed not by DHS but by Health and Human Services. And I do think that with the children's uh, custody, uh, federal custody of unaccompanied minors, we are looking into the future, I, I think, perhaps I hope, with uh, how immigration detention reform may, may proceed for adults. Um, they have greater access to counsel, medical, counseling services, and, um, and an emphasis on reunification with family and the community. So um, I, I do think that that is a, uh, it's the, although not perfect, uh, a model that we can draw uh, many lessons from in terms of reforming our, our, our adult detention system. Thank you, Jonathan. I have one point to follow up on. Um, I am not certain, but I think that we, when we were in Austin for the dialogue there, you talked a bit about limited representation. Is that right? For That's limited correct. representation yes. for bonds. Was that a Absolutely. positive point there? Yes. I mean, when a person, when an attorney submits an E-28, which is the form that notifies the court that you are a representative, you are, as we say, on the hook until the immigration judge releases you, uh, you file a motion to withdraw, you must, you are mandated to continue with that representation. Uh, there are many people who want to get involved in custody representation in order to be able to get people out of detention to where they can go to where they need to go or remain in the area and complete their cases, but are unable to, to, to sign on for the complete case, which could last for years. Uh, and, and so um, we are, we, we, we definitely um, recommend strongly that immigration judges accept, are able to accept an E-28 for the limited purpose of representing an individual, for example, in a custody hearing, and then allowing that person to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to exit custody and potentially seek representation on his or her own behalf. And I guess that's a point that would be valid for paid counsel as well as pro bono, right? If someone was able to do the bond and the person gets out, even if that's all the representation they could afford, mm -hmm. the point would still hold true that once they're out of custody, they're better able to seek even pro bono counsel on their own. That's right. And as a pro bono attorney, it's, it's, it's an obstacle because when you, are in, when you enter into a case, judges are very reluctant to release you because they are, they rightfully assume that if they have a pro bono representative, they may be unlikely to be able to afford private counsel. And so it can be an obstacle, a deterrent from even pro bono counsel or non-for-profit counsel to assist people in a, in a custody hearing. Thank you. Um, Brianna, now um, uh, we'll turn and call on you. Um, in a number of the regional dialogues, we talked about um, the lessons learned in the public defender context and looked at a variety of models from um, 
how access to counsel was created and improved uh, through that model and wanted to ask you from your perspective in the federal public defender's office, um, what, ha what have you seen? What do you think works? What lessons do you have for us? And if we have time, if there are models at the state level PD context that you could share with us as well. I'll start by thanking Human Rights First for letting me in the building. Um, I often say at these kind of dialogues, you know, the, the public defender is usually the villain in the story, right? Somebody had their green card, they were doing great, they walked along, and then they got bad advice from a public defender. <laughs> so I would like to say on behalf of all my brothers and sisters out there, we are trying to atone for the sins of the past, and, um, and I'll talk some about the models um, that we're doing to try to help immigrants before they get into the immigration system to understand what's going to happen to them. Um, I come from a world where we've had uh, council government expense for, for quite a while, as many of you know, and I think was referenced earlier. This is the 50th anniversary of Gideon, and, and, and frankly, even years before that, many states were experimenting with government-sponsored council. Sorry. Um, and in that time, we've obviously learned a lot of lessons about what, um, what best practices are. And so whether you're a person who believes that um, every person in immigration should have an attorney, or if you think that's a pie-in-the-sky idea, or frankly, if you think both of those things at the same time, I think Gideon teaches some important lessons. Um, the first lesson that I think is important to recognize is that uh, counsel provides efficiencies beyond the obvious ones. And we've talked about maybe some of those today, but I want to just kind of specify three things, three points at which counsel create, creates efficiencies that might not be obvious. Um, you know, if you, if you remember your history, before the Gideon realm, there was um, a lot of opposition by states to um, government-funded counsel. And yet, as you look, even in the 30 years between cases like Powell versus Alabama and Betts versus Brady that led up to you, having worked in the criminal defense system, it's not because they were really worried about the defendants, okay? <laughs> what it is is that counsel provides these efficiencies. So one is that counsel tells uh, clients when to stand and fight and when to lay down arms, right? So a, an effective counsel, one of the most important things that we do in the criminal justice system is, is not only to bring uh, government overstepping to, to court's attention, but to tell clients when they should lay down their arms, move through the system as quickly as possible, take a plea, fight for the best sentence possible, but not stay and litigate motions and trials and things like that. You know, the second thing is that counsel, when, when there is a case that's going to be litigated, counsel obviously streamlines that process. Um, you know, there's, I've, I've worked in the court system as well and dealt with tons and tons of pro se motions where you just look and they're citing to the Supreme Court of Jupiter and well, I don't know what that means. You know, counsel is able to step in and make sure that where there are claims that are viable, that they're presented in the most efficient means possible. And the third thing that might not be obvious is that counsel plays a role that is currently being played by the immigration court systems, which is the communication aspect. When is my next court date? Uh, what, what's the timeline here? What, do I, what information do I need to gather? Um, keeping in touch with family and, and things like that. You know, one of the earlier panels talked about the oversight question. Well, counsel plays that role as well. We're in the detention centers knowing what's going on, playing some of that role of knowing when medical needs aren't being met, when psychiatric needs aren't being met. Now, I know that there are skeptics, um, and I would, I would encourage you to, to read a colloquy from the federal court someday in the Ferretta context, the context where a person wants to assert their right not to have an attorney. I think these are some of the funniest colloquies you will ever read, because here's the judge trying to say, are you sure you don't want a lawyer? I mean, every single one of them has, you know, from long ago, we've said that any person who represents himself has a fool for a lawyer, you know, ever, trotted out every single time. Uh, you know, I would have a lawyer if I was in the system. I, you never hear such wonderful things said about federal defenders as when a judge is trying to convince a client to, to stick with us instead of being pro se. And it, again, it's not that they're concerned about the defendant, because I've seen the way that clients get sentenced on the other end. It's that things move more, more efficiently through the system with an attorney present. Um, I'd also, you know, I'd like to shine a light on another efficiency that I don't think is always part of the conversation, and that is the uh, resources that are spent by the federal government in the illegal reentry context. So, as you may or may not know, uh, I think as of fiscal year 2011, more than half of the, every federal prosecution is an immigration-related crime. It's either entry or illegal reentry. Um, more than 50 percent. 
right? So that means in, in every one of those cases, there is a federal defender who is reviewing a very thick A file. Uh, there's a federal prosecutor who's reviewing that file. Um, I will tell you, because it's part of my role to pass on those cases, just for background, it's in that case, it's, it's a, a, a viable defense to say that the underlying deportation proceeding was fundamentally unfair. Okay, so that means in each of those cases, there are attorneys on both sides spending time going through that file to make sure that the, the underlying proceeding was fundamentally fair. Um, I will tell you from my experience, you know, I can say that today we are filing in the Los Angeles Federal Defender Office alone. We're filing three challenges to the underlying deportation order. We won't win all of them, believe me, but we're filing three, right? And, and I've estimated that in those cases, we spend about 20 hours at a minimum filing the mo or preparing the motion to dismiss the case. We often have to uh, hire an expert at government expense. A federal prosecutor is then sitting and not prosecuting, uh, you know, these huge mortgage fraud cases or, you know, sexual assaults and stuff like that. They're spending time trying to figure out what happened in immigration court. Uh, and I would guess they're spending an equal amount of time to what we are. Then a federal judge is spending another, or, or his clerks are spending another 15 or 20 hours reviewing that motion. Um, court time, all this stuff is being used, um, and the federal government is paying all three sides of that battle, right? They're paying for the federal defender and the government and the court. Um, each year, federal defenders prevail in those motions because we're finding people who were citizens, we're finding people who were eligible for relief, we're finding people who weren't deportable for the crimes that they're uh, charged with, all based on existing law, right? We can't say, well, now it's not an aggravated. We have to base it on existing law, which is part of what actually takes so much time, is finding out, well, what in 1994 was the definition of aggravated felony, right? Um, these errors exact, obviously, steep human costs, right? A number of, I have gone to naturalization ceremonies of my 1326 clients, and they've been deported multiple times, and that's, you know, breaking up families, separating them from their wives and children and all that stuff. But it's obviously also costing a lot of federal government dollars that could be used on other kinds of prosecutions. So in terms of the efficiencies, when you talk about what efficiencies are created by counsel, I think we need to take those into account as well. Um, I'll add, uh, the, I guess another lesson that I would point out is that if you believe that some or all people in immigration custody deserve to have counsel at government expense, uh, those, those conversations need to start years in advance, right? So if, we, if you're a person who's looking at vulnerable populations, the mentally ill or the children, uh, those are conversations that can't happen once you've already filed the motion and the preliminary injunction, and now you think, wait a second, who is she gonna appoint if she grants our, motion, our preliminary injunction? It has to start years earlier talking about, well, what kind of models exist? So one of the things I was asked to talk about is just kind of what models do exist for government-sponsored counsel. And there's two, there's two uh, general, I guess, models, right? One is the public defender model, and, and you're all probably familiar with that. It's a central model where um, a team of lawyers uh, represent any indigent person who is appointed counsel in a single courtroom. There are also, and I know this one's less known, so I thought I'd share about it, excuse me, models that work on a contract system, right? So there's places, there are states that instead of having a public defender office, they contract out to individual criminal defense attorneys to take those uh, kinds of cases. Um, contract and pan uh, panel models are very quick to get off the ground. That's one of the advantages, that's why a lot of states use them, right? Because you're using the existing infrastructure, exi existing criminal defense attorneys without having to have the cost of an office and a law library and, and IT people and all these kind of things. Um, the public defender model, though, has, has two distinct advantages kind of over the long haul. And I'm not at all saying that if there were to be someday a criminal, uh, an immigrant public defender model that it would look like this, but there are two efficiencies that are important to recognize. One is in terms of economies of, over, uh, economies of scale over the long term, right? Uh, the statistics show that people in public defender models have a lower cost per defendant than, contra than the states that are using contract models. Um, and the second, which might not be as obvious, is in terms of independence, right? If a person is getting appointed by a court then and has to ask that court for expert funds or to justify their hours to get paid, there's a cost in terms of the independence of that model. Why should you be talking about this now? You know, for one thing, once a model is in place, 
there's inertia. It doesn't change, right? So even in these states that have been presented with the statistics about here is how much more per head that you are paying for legal counsel, there's just, there's, these things have inertia, they don't change. But second, it takes a lot of time to talk to the stakeholders in your area to figure out what resources exist, how are you gonna develop those resources, especially when we're talking about people who are two and three hours away from the local facility, how would you even create a model that would represent the people that are there? I'll say in LA, we have the similar problems. Um, you know, our closest facility used to be about an hour away and I would go frequently to visit the people in Santa Ana Jail. We're now, everybody's kind of shifting north. Most of our people are in Adelanto, and it takes me about two and a half hours if I leave right in the middle of the day, right? And so not dealing with LA traffic, but that's kind of the least efficient way to do anything is to take out the whole middle of your day. Um, so these are long conversations that I think need to start long before you, you go and ask for a pub, you know, to have government counsel for some of these people. You need to think, what does that actually look like? What is it actually gonna mean if there's a right to juvenile or mentally ill to have counsel. Um, lastly, I just wanted to talk briefly about what public defenders are trying to do to, um, to lessen the gap of counsel. Um, since Padilla, a number of, of public defenders have created a position within their offices um, to meet the needs of their non-citizen population. Uh, there's a lot of places that have one person, but you know, like in LA County, there is literally one person who is a half-time appellate lawyer, half-time immigration person, who's covering you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of attorneys. But even so, she's single-handedly raising this, the level of, of advice that's being given to, to defendants. At the other extreme are places like the Brooklyn Defender Services that's providing direct services, which I just think is unbelievable, to uh, their criminal defense clients at the other end of their sentences. Um, our office kind of takes a middle approach. So I'm an appellate attorney and I have 50% um, of my time is, is um, supposed to be spent in um, advising people about these illegal reentry charges and teaching a brand new baby attorney how to read an A file. Um, I pass on all those motions. I make sure that we're raising all the right claims. I also try to pass on anybody who is an LPR who we're advising to accept a certain plea. I try to make sure that we're giving them complete advice about what the consequence of that plea is gonna be. Um, I do a lot of substantive training in my office um, on everything from derivative citizenship to you know, what's the current state of gang asylum claims because it's a very hot topic among our client population. Um, another thing that I think is, is important is you know, when we craft a plea, that we think is not an aggravated felony or that leaves them open for cancellation of removal, we create a packet of materials for that person to hand to the immigration judge when they get there that says, okay, here at tab A is the indictment that shows that the loss was under $10,000. And here's the plea agreement that showed that the total loss was this much. And here, just in case you don't know it, is the Ninth Circuit case that says that this is what it means, right? So we're trying to create packets of information that our clients can take directly to the immigration judge so that the good work that we try to do in the criminal court actually gets effectuated. Um, we, another thing that we're trying to do is where we have clients who are being enhanced or have problems based on convictions that seem to be in violation of Padilla, we're going back into the state courts and trying to litigate those cases for our clients. Um, and then lastly, you know, where we have these clients who we know are gonna be in immigration custody, we try to connect them with um, pro bono counsel, although those pleas, I mean, it's really just getting tougher and tougher for me to farm out those cases. But also, you know, we, um, we try to keep a stack of pro se kind of motions and things that we can hand to our clients. If you're stuck and, and they say they're gonna put you on a bus this afternoon, here's a, here's a sample motion to stay of deportation. Um, all, and I would just make a pitch here because I have so many great important people in the room that all three of these models rely on our local immigration service providers to help us, right? I rely on the fact that I can call people and they will answer my question about how a certain thing is gonna work. Um, we even rely on our local immigration court, which just this last year uh, allowed me to bring a group of public defenders on a field trip to come and see what immigration court looked like. They met with the chief judge in the morning and then sat in on a bunch of individual hearings so that they could have some picture what their client would be facing when they got there. I want to, with the caveat that I want to make sure it's clear that this is not a substitute for counsel. Having your public defender give you a pack of materials is great, but if your immigration judge has a question, then I am not there, right, to answer the question. Um, but while we talk about kind of in the meantime, while we're waiting for 
these great things to happen. Um, I hope that you're all supporting your local, the one attorney you know your client is going to see before they get to immigration custody. Thank you, Brianna. Um, those are really valuable tips, and I may be being optimistic, but as we look ahead and think of various ways to address the, pro the problem, it's really good to hear from your experience and what's worked and what hasn't worked and how to think about structure before you get too far down attached to one model. The one question I wanted to ask is in contrasting the in-house public defender with the contract attorney that you mentioned, and one of the advantages was the decreased cost per case of doing it in-house, is that just because of building up institutional expertise, or is that because of the infrastructure of having uh, lawyers on the payroll, or to what did you attribute that? I mean, I think it has to do with, with economies of scale, meaning that if you are paying contract attorneys, you're obviously part of that money is going to overhead to their own office costs and their secretary and all that stuff. And, you know, if I can have a secretary that covers four attorneys, right, that's a much cheaper model. I think that's what it's attributable to. But I will say that the other thing that public defenders can do better than independent attorneys is deal with kind of overarching systematic problems, right? So, um, you know, if we, uh, one of the things we've done recently is that our plea agreements have some language about, a, you know, a supposed Padilla advisory, right? And we weren't happy with the way it looked originally. And so rather than like 75 attorneys trying to talk to the U.S. attorney and each trying to get the language they wanted, or, you know, we, we as a coalition went together and we said, here's the model language we think would work better to advise. And so you can kind of deal with some of those, those systematic problems on, on, you know, dealing with one attorney as opposed to the number of attorneys. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, the moment everyone's been waiting for, um, Director Asuna, okay. let me say, first of all, thank you for coming here and taking your time to be with us. And uh, um, it, I know that your schedule didn't permit you to come to some of the regional dialogues, so we were um, uh, disappointed not to have the chance to hear from you. And some of, some of the repeated concerns or considerations that are coming up are ones that you just haven't had the chance to respond to before. And I know that increasing access to counsel has been a personal priority for you in your tenure, but I, so I wanna take the chance to hear from you what you have been able to do, what EOIR has done generally, what may be in the works, and how you respond to some of the concerns and persistent problems that we have addressed this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you to Human Rights First and Jones Day for having me here. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons that I really um, enjoy these things is because, you know, I always learn quite a bit, a lot from the co-panelists, from the audience, from uh, discussions after you know the panels or before the panels. So. This is no exception, and I really want to uh, spend some time uh, hearing some of your thoughts, hearing some of uh, what is going on on the ground. You know, uh, Ken and Jonathan uh, shared some very interesting things that, that, uh, that I think uh, really informs this debate going forward. I don't have any good bus stories, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I couldn't help thinking when Jonathan was talking about his, his bus, you know, this, this metaphor popped into my head about uh, comprehensive immigration reform, about getting on a bus and thinking that we're going to a certain, uh, certain location, a certain route, and then you know finding ourselves someplace else. Uh, and as we as we get into this immigration reform debate, uh, which we've been in uh, so much, you know I hope that some of the issues that we're talking about today don't get lost into the larger debate about immigration reform, because certainly the big issues with immigration reform are the ones that you hear about, you know legalization and work verification and border controls and things like that. Uh, but some of these due process issues are quite important as well. Uh, in, in fact, I would say probably even more important uh, post-reform uh, than, uh, than they are now. You know, I think all of us in government are, for example, a little bit, uh, uh, let's just say, a little uh, scared about what, uh, you know, uh, a legalization program uh, for 10 million people uh, could do to, you know, representation, you know, and the opportunity for a lot of bad lawyers or bad, uh, um, you know, notarios to come out and actually take advantage of, of that population. So all these ideas I think are important. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out who the member of Congress is going to be, the, the nice gentleman at the end that saves Jonathan and uh, Fez and for it, who that's going to be in the immigration reform debate, but we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll find somebody, I, I hope. Um, let me just start uh, taking a little bit from, you know, the, the kind of the local and then uh, the ideas that, that were discussed earlier and more kind of on the national level and give you some 
uh, initial stats as to what the current situation is of the immigration court system and particularly levels of representation. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it continues to be a very you know, heavy caseload. Uh, 400, well over 400,000 matters in the last fiscal year were dealt with in the immigration courts, uh, were received in the immigration courts, uh, and uh, the number of matters decided was about 380. Uh, so you do the math, you know that uh, that's not going in the right direction. It's going uh, that there are more cases coming in than the immigration judges and the immigration court staff can actually handle. Uh, that's resulting in some significant backlogs in a lot of the, the, the uh, non-detained settings especially. Um, we, um, well, there are currently about 265 immigration judges. Uh, we'll, we'll be up to 265. That's um, about static and uh, the, the, the good news there is that it's a little bit We've been able to maintain you know, some levels, but the bad news is that the trend here is actually going downward uh, because of the very, very serious hiring freezes uh, at the Justice Department, at, throughout the federal government. You know, uh, uh, those of the, that have been working um, in uh, you know, budget issues in the government for a long time uh, tell me that this is the worst budget climate that they've seen in about 50 or 60 years. Uh, so that's the reality that we have to deal with. Uh, which means that we, you know, we will not be increasing resources, judges, staff, et cetera, law clerks in the near future. The best that we can really hope for is uh, to uh, the status quo. Uh, now, we do hope that immigration reform may you know, affect that in some way, but, uh, but we'll see what happens with that. In the detained settings, not so quickly in the non-detained settings, uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the, the Attorney General has given us you know, case, case completion deadlines for the detained dockets, and we have to adhere to those. But the more people get put into detention, the more people get uh, sent through the detained dockets, the more resources are drawn from the non-detained dockets, and therefore the wait times and, uh, and backlogs get longer on that side of the house. Uh, and we'll see, again, what immigration reform brings with that. Uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that it may alleviate you know, some areas, but it's just really too early to say what the effect will be uh, going forward. Let's talk about the quantity of representation and get you some, uh, some numbers here. Again, I think that those of us that have been doing this for a long time and those of you that have been looking at this issue for a long time, you know, we can report a little bit of good news um, uh, uh, in terms of trends over the last few years. Uh, but that comes with a couple of big caveats. Uh, it used to be, the, when I first joined the, uh, the Justice Department about 12 years ago, representation rates were about 40 to 50, 40 to 45 percent overall, you know, throughout the entire system. Uh, right now, the latest numbers that I have is that in FY 2012, currently the overall representation rate in the immigration court system is, is, is 56 percent. So it's a little bit of an improvement. It's not, you know, great. Uh, it's not, uh, you're still talking about almost half people, half of the people overall are still going through pro se. Uh, but it is, uh, go, at least it is better than it used to be, you know, a few years ago. But when you look behind those numbers, that's when kind of some of the interesting um, uh, stats really come out. Uh, in the non-detained dockets, representation rates are generally very high. Um, in, in the BIA, for example, uh, you're talking about an 80% representation rate overall, uh, which is good. And in many of the non-detained immigration courts, meaning you know Boston, Hartford, uh, San Francisco, some of the other courts where you have a lot of individual asylum hearings, a lot of things like that, uh, you're talking about very high representation rates, sometimes over 90% in some courts. Uh, and that's in the, in the non-detained dockets. Um, but that is typically the individual hearing stage, not often at the master calendar hearing, hearing stage. Uh, and when you move into the detained side of the house, that's when the numbers become quite concerning and, and remain quite concerning, frankly. Uh, the number that you've heard before, I think, is about 16% overall uh, in the non-detained doc, I'm sorry, in, in the detained settings. Uh, that's about right. The numbers, the numbers that we have are actually a little bit higher. It's closer to about 20%. But still, it's not, you know, it's not a great representation rate uh, for the detained settings. In some detention centers, it's quite low. I think in Stewart, Georgia, which was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Ken, I think it was about 12%, I think, um, in, in, uh, in Stewart, uh, which is very, very low. Uh, and it's actually uh, probably one of the lower ones in the, in, the, um, in the country. So there is still a lot of work to do in the detained settings. Uh, I think, again, things are better overall, in the, especially in the non-detained settings, but it is, um, it is quite a problem. The quality of representation also continues to be a big concern. Uh, and this is something that, when I first joined the BIA 12 years ago, it really kind of hit me in the face how badly many people were represented. Uh, you know, to, and I remember you know, my, my first day at the board, seeing my first canned brief, you know, 
Uh, it was a brief for an asylum seeker, and uh, the the attorney had not the the quote unquote attorney had not bothered to change the gender from he to she. You know, from the prior briefs that he had filed before, and so it was like you know uh, uh, what am I so. Um, uh, that was uh, that. That unfortunately continues to be a big problem in many courts. Uh, you heard a reference to the Los, to Los Angeles earlier. Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Immigration Court, which is the biggest court in the country, well over 50,000 cases pending, uh, has one of the worst uh, uh, levels of representation, not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. Uh, a very, uh, very notarial, rich uh, environment in Los Angeles and some other places as well. So that um, that certainly continues to be a, a concern. EOIR receives about 400 complaints a year um, about the quality of representation uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country. Most of them come from individual uh, immigrants that uh, complain about, uh, about their lawyers, uh, mostly in terms of competence and diligence. You know, things anywhere from canned briefs that I mentioned to not showing up at court, missing deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. And that, uh, that unfortunately continues to be um, a significant issue. Um, I was really struck by uh, the comments about um, the, the, the impact on the courts, because uh, it is not just a matter of due process. Certainly that is why we're talking about this. The main reason we're talking about it, you know, we're talking about a very serious uh, set of consequences if somebody is not well represented. If you're talking about an asylum claim or, or a cat claim, you, you could be talking about a life or death. Uh, but it is, uh, and that's the reason to do it, but it is not only, uh, the, that's not the only reason to actually uh, want to have a good counsel uh, quality counsel and adequate counsel. Uh, it is the uh, the efficiency issue, and you know to the extent that you people are well represented in, in immigration court, especially in detained settings, uh, it makes the job of the court a lot easier. It makes the job of the uh, the judge a lot easier. Judges don't have to spend as much time trying to make sure that person people understand the charges, they understand what they're being ch uh, charged with, and any relief available. Um, uh, but that assumes that you, that, that, uh, that you do have to have good counsel. So that is one of the issues that, uh, that we see a lot. Uh, a significant percentage of the caseload at the BIA, just to give you an illustration here, are motions to reopen based, of ineffect based on ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, the motion practice at the board is extremely high. I forget what the numbers are, but, you know, uh, but a certainly very, very high percentage of caseload of cases at the board. And when you break those down, uh, a good percentage of those are based on ineffective assistance, uh, matter of Lozada claims and, and those types of issues that come up all the time. So when you uh, actually have good counsel, uh, it helps not just the, the uh, person, but also the uh, system as well. Uh, let me just go briefly about some of what EOIR has been doing uh, to try to address these issues over the last few years. Um, one of the first things that I did when I, uh, when I became director a few years ago is that I, um, I, moved, I created an Office of Legal Assets Programs in the office of the director. And I asked Steve Lang, who's in the back, who most of you know, who ran our legal orientation program, uh, to come up and head that office. The mandate of that office is to take the, the lessons of the LOP, take the lessons of some of the other things, the great work that Steve and others have done, and see what else we can do uh, in terms of encouraging counsel, in terms of uh, in terms of trying to uh, trying to increase capacity for uh, for these cases, uh, especially in a context where we're dealing with you know a very a limited number of resources and ever increasing caseloads, the um, just to uh, sidetrack is a little bit with regard to the legal orientation program, uh, an update on the numbers on that. Uh, there are roughly uh, or there are 27 LOP sites around the country these days. Uh, 25 of them are in detention centers, 20, uh, the other two are, are non-detained settings. Uh, and uh, last year, uh, about 60,000 detained individuals were reached by the LOP nationwide. Uh, that is a, that's a good number, but unfortunately, it's, it's still only about a third of all the people that go through, uh, through the immigration detention settings that, where they're facing removal uh, every year. So uh, that's the, thanks to the good work of all the, the LOP and the LOP contractors. Probably many of you are in the room are, are associated with LOP contractors, so I thank you for the good work on that. Uh, and this is an area that we would really like to see uh, expanded. The LOP is one of these examples, as was mentioned earlier, uh, where it's a win-win situation because you're increasing access, you're increasing education, you're, you're, protect, you're trying to protect your process, and you're also increasing efficiency. You know, when we talk about the LOP on the Hill, uh, we don't re really need to do a lot of selling. It's, uh, you know, people, people get it. Even people that want to have more removals, <laughs> you know, they want to have just uh, more, uh, understand that uh, the things like the LOP uh, is one of those win-win situations where you're actually increasing efficiency as well. 
Uh, we would certainly like to see that. I think the department is certainly behind that. The administration is behind increased funding for that. Uh, we'll see if that is possible uh, on the Hill uh, with, uh, with the current uh, budget uh, climate the way it is. Uh, but again, it's one of those programs that you, um, that you really uh, want to see expanded. Uh, I've asked uh, uh, Steve to, and, and, the, uh, and the Office of Legal Access Programs to take a look at a couple of other issues. One is the recognition and accreditation program uh, that the BIA handles. And those of you that are not familiar with this is that the, the Board of Immigration Appeals certifies or, or approves organizations and individuals to appear uh, and represent people, who, uh, non-lawyers, uh, who to, to appear and represent people in immigration court under some uh, procedures that, are, that have been set for a long time. Uh, in my view, those, there's a, there might be a capacity here it might be an opportunity here to really do something creative with this program. And the way, I look, the way that we look at this is that we have been participating um, with, uh, an anti, within the anti-notario initiative within the federal government for the last few years, where USCIS and some others in the FTC uh, have, uh, you know, have created a working group of, of, uh, of agencies to really try to go after some of these bad notarios around the country. And that's worked really well in many areas. The way I look at it, as we put the bad guys out of business, we also need to increase capacity for the good guys. Uh, and that's where the RNA program comes in. Uh, I think that uh, the recognition and accreditation regulations are a little bit outdated. We may be able to do something creative here, uh, especially, again, in the context of CIR. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully immigration reform will happen, you know, in the next year or so. So this may not be ready in time for, uh, for, the, to, for the onslaught of legalization. but. Uh, I think that uh, as more opportunities uh, come up over the next couple of years, uh, the RNA program, if we do this right, uh, will be an important component of that. Many of you participated in a couple of the public forums that we did last year on the RNA program. I thank you for that. We'll be doing some more this year. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've gotten some very, very good ideas. Uh, and, um, and I encourage you to reach out to Steve and, and his staff that are working on this as we go forward. Um, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do as well is a little bit more intangible. You know, we've been working a lot with the Katzman study group. Um, you know, I think what they have done in New York is just really phenomenal in many ways. Uh, what Judge Katzman has, has, uh, has tried to do in terms of encouraging people to come forward, pro bono uh, or law firms to come forward. I know that Karen has been deeply involved in that. Uh, and to the extent that we can facilitate things like that, uh, I, think that uh, I think that that will help as well. Uh, all of these things are not panaceas. They're not, you know, in, in and of themselves, they're not the, the, the fix. But I think we, what we hope for is that all these things working together creates, you know, creates a certain amount of a, a, a raft of materials that we can actually use to, uh, to, uh, to make things easier and better uh, in immigration court. Uh, finally, let me just tend to spend a couple of, uh, a couple of time, uh, words on CA. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about counsel, you know, uh, over the last few years about what is possible with government paid counsel, what is not possible, you know, and, we'll, and, and we will see what, um, you know, what Congress does. I think from our point of view, from the Justice Department's point of view, we, you know, we've had a, a lot of, um, uh, we, we've done a lot of work on a lot of this stuff, and we've really have spent some time trying to think about what is possible within the current statutory and budgetary constra uh, constraints. You know, I think uh, it's fair to say that, um, you know, if you were watching the Judiciary Committee hearing a few weeks ago when the Attorney General testified, uh, he was asked specifically about government paid counsel uh, for uh, unaccompanied children. Uh, and, uh, and he gave a very good answer that says that this is just, you know, not who we are as a country to have children appearing, <coughs> excuse me, appearing in immigration court without lawyers. Um, uh, if Congress, if the Senate were to come up with some language on this, I think that the uh, you know, we would be, uh, we would like to work with them on that. Uh, there's other opportunities for other counsel as well. I mean, there's the, uh, the, uh, the people with mental competency issues that you may have heard about before. There may, some, may be some opportunities there as well. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, it is a good opportunity now that we are looking at CIR uh, to not let this window of opportunity pass and see what is possible. You know, we all understand the budget realities uh, and, some of the other, and some of the other constraints as well. Um, but um, I think that if there's an opportunity to actually get some amendments in there that, uh, that we can add to the raft of, you know, solutions, uh, uh, then uh, we will uh, all be better off. Um, so let me stop there. I look forward to the discussion, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Juan, very much. I have um, two quick follow-ups, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. Um, a lot of what we've talked about is the placement 
of detention facilities in remote rural areas and the way that impacts access to counsel. Of course, EOIR isn't the one that chooses where to place detention facilities. So my two questions are, um, what can EOIR do to deal with those placements in terms of placing more judges in those facilities, mm -hmm. other measures like that that you may be thinking of. And the second one is where can you lean on government partners? Because often we're quick to say government should do blah, right. blah, right? But we're looking at a variety of different agencies involved in the process. And what can EOIR do or what are you doing to work with your DHS government partners to ameliorate that facility placement yeah I, I think that the the issue of facility placement is is a is a challenge I mean uh, it's a challenge for EIR as well as for uh, people that have to appear in immigration court because often there's just simply not enough judges to go around um, nobody uh, uh, you know we would certainly prefer to have a judge in the courtroom for every case that comes in uh, and uh, it, it, you know especially at these places where somebody is detained I think we're trying to do more with ICE. Uh, we've been having dialogues with ICE for the last few years, trying to, and, and you know, this is, this is kind of a terrible indictment of the federal government, I suppose, but there hasn't in the past been a lot of great coordination. I know it's shocking, you know, that uh, federal agencies don't coordinate with each other as well as they should. Uh, but frankly, we can do better. Uh, we can do better to, to plan these things, to, to work with our partners, to, you know, to, uh, if, if there is, you know, a detention facility that's planned for, you know, rural Texas or something, um, then uh, we can, uh, uh, not that there is, yeah. <laughs> not, not putting any, <laughs> or at least I'm not aware of any. Another one. Uh, uh, <laughs> then uh, I think we can do better to do, you know, a lot of the legwork. These things take years, as you know. These things, you know, you can't, you don't set up a facility next month. I mean, these things take uh, years and, um, and we are trying very hard to have those close relationships with ICE uh, and with other uh, agencies as well to, uh, to try to plan a little bit better. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that you know, is possible and I think is worth looking at, uh, and certainly this, is, this may come up in the, in the CIR context, is alternatives to detention. You know? And that has the possibility, if it's done right, uh, to, um, uh, to alleviate some of the placement of people in some of these remote facilities or in detention facilities overall. Detention, as you, all of you know, is very expensive for the federal government. Um, uh, and if ATD, as soon as the detention is, is done the right way, then there's some possibilities there for, uh, for uh, the benefit of uh, various folks throughout the system. We're doing a couple of pilots right now with, uh, with, with ICE uh, in Baltimore and in Denver uh, on ATD, uh, and we'll see where those, you know, where those lead. Um, but, um, but a lot of it does come down to really just the hard, you know, coordinating work uh, you know, at the staff level, uh, that's ongoing, and uh, and you know, and we can certainly do better in that way. Very good, thank you. I think we have about five minutes to take a couple of questions, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Oh, we can take ten. Oh, even better. Thank you, Ruthie. Um, ten minutes for questions. If people have a appetite for questions here at the end of the day, Eleanor. So, sorry, my apologies if I missed it when I stepped out of the room for a minute, but I know uh, the panelists had, had raised a question about limited representation. Right. Um, and I don't know, did you ever, did you guys get to circle back and Juan to get your thoughts on it? Because I know um, we've had a couple of folks tell us from different parts of the country that limited representation would be a really important tool for increasing representation in the immigration detention context. And, and I'll add to that question. We discussed it here in the question of bond. Um, but it's also come up for master calendars only, just to help people uh, identify responding to pleadings and identifying forms of relief. Yeah, it's, it's something that I'd like to hear more about. I mean, we are looking at it, uh, specifically in the context of bond, you know, um, uh, as to see what's possible in that regard. Um, but I haven't heard a lot about it in terms of, in terms of other master calendars or, or, or things like that. So it's something that I can tell you that we are working on, uh, again, in the bond context. But if there's, a, if there's a good idea to extend it beyond that, then, you know, certainly, you know, we're all yours. Okay, Brittany. Hi, Brittany Nystrom with LIRS. I, we heard a lot of talk last year about ICE attempting to reduce pressure on the immigration courts with their prosecutorial discretion initiative. There hasn't been a lot of um, talk recently about how that's going. And I was just wondering if we could get an update both from the practitioners 
and from you, Mr. Osuna, about whether that has had any impact on bringing down some of the new filings or closing out some of the existing filings in front of the immigration court. Yeah, let me, uh, so a couple of things on that. Uh, you know, we, we, um, I'm a big fan of prosecutorial discretion, or PD as we call it. You know, it's, it's one of these things where in the immigration context, people seem to be surprised at it, you know? And, um, and, you know, when I talk to some of my colleagues in the criminal justice context, it's like, you know, what's the big deal? I mean, prosecutors do this all the time in every court of the country, every single court of the country. Immigration court should, be, should not be any different. So uh, I think that we have had, you know, um, frankly, it's been a little mixed, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the results. I think that uh, the, I don't have the latest numbers, but the number of cases that have been closed out have been uh, a little bit on the low side. However, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, not an insignificant decrease in the number of new filings. Now, whether that's directly related to the PD initiative, you know, is a little bit hard to say, but I'm pretty convinced that having looked at the numbers for the last year or so, that at least part of that decrease of new filings uh, is, based, uh, is based in part on the initiative. A lot of them are USCIS cases that didn't get filed. A lot of them, uh, because as many of you know, uh, the initiative you know, focused not just on ICE filings, but also on USCIS filings. And um, what uh, it, it appears, it appears that, a, that a, a, a significant portion of the decrease of new filings are USCIS, is USCIS looking at things differently, taking another look at the cases before they file an NTA, uh, and, and that's good. So, uh, but you know, having said that, even though the results for current cases may not be, you know, uh, as high as some would like, um, I think that the initiative was important because of institu trying to institutionalize this concept of PD. I mean, this is, again, this is just good government. This is good government, especially in an area, an, an era of uh, of decreased resources and inadequate resources throughout the system. You know, uh, requiring prosecutors to take a look at these cases and saying, Do what, is this really a priority for the federal government? to try to seek a removal order on. It's just a healthy, you know, exercise to, to institutionalize. So, um, you know, we've always looked at the PD initiative as something that, you know, should be uh, an ongoing thing, not a one-shot deal. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we'll see. Uh, I think the effects of this might be something that are not felt right away, but hopefully, you know, as we go into the future. So. Any other questions in the room? Yes, sir. Up here in the front. And I should say, can you please identify yourself again? I, I just want to ask a brief question. Can, is there a way of resolving some of these deportation issues before the person actually finishes their prison term so there's no need to send them to a detention center? In other words, the, the issue can, should be, seem like it should be resolved before their day of release from jail. Um, I suppose there is. I mean, the, the, you know, the, it depends on where they are. You know, I would, I would think. I mean, if they're in a bureau of prisons facility, you know, that uh, there may be more of an opportunity there to, you know, to come up with something where they're released early and, and you know, removed early, uh, rather than um, than in the state. I think it becomes more difficult in a state facility. Um, is is that what you're asking? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, yes. I mean, there is a program called the Institutional Hearing Program where immigration judges actually do go into the facilities, into the prison facilities, uh, and, and ICE goes in there, and they actually, um, you know, have the removal hearing uh, while the person is still serving his or her criminal sentence, and the idea is to have a removal order ready for when the person actually, you know, completes a sentence, then they're immediately removed, uh, and, you know, it may be worth looking as to whether it's removal is possible before that. What's that? Sure. I mean, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want, you know, uh, there, if you're looking for removal, you know, for removal orders, it's. Not be removed. And then he's just gets out of jail and he goes about his business right. or resolved that he should be removed. And, you, re, you know, so he doesn't have to spend six months at a detention center trying to figure out whether he should be removed or not. 
say that can be useful in those cases where people are identified and receive a notice to appear when they are serving a criminal sentence, but there are many, many people in removal proceedings who are never in criminal jail who haven't committed any crimes and are coming into contact with the system because of simple immigration violations, overstays or something. So they are not, uh, they don't always surface for the first time in the criminal context. Um, Ken, you had a recommendation you wanted us to come back to, or did you want to touch yes, on no, this? I, I, I did want to should... talk about that a little bit because, um, you know, to me, uh, getting someone out of detention is the greatest solution to uh, representation, to their access to counsel, to their access to the, the resources that they need for their families. And there's two two things that are happening that make that very difficult. One is the timeliness of the bond hearing, okay? And second is that the, the respondents, the aliens, do not know about their right to a bond hearing. Um, so what, what happens is someone comes into immigration, and so those of you who don't know, uh, ICE makes an initial custody determination, and there's a little ch checkbox on the form that they say, your bond is $5,000, and there's a little checkbox that says, oh, I want a judge to review this. Well, that piece of paper magically does not get filed with the court um, and does not trigger a process for someone to actually have a bond hearing. Uh, and, and the poor guy who checked off that box on that piece of paper thinks he has done something meaningful and he has not. Uh, and so he sits around and waits three to four weeks in a detained setting for a first master calendar hearing where he'll first have his opportunity to ask a judge hey, when I checked off that piece of paper, you know, why, why didn't I get, why didn't something happen? Um, so that's one thing. And also kind of the timeliness of it. Uh, now uh, the, the um, completion uh, goal for bond hearings, when someone actually requests a bond hearing, um, is three weeks. And, you know, my experience back in the battle days was that, you know, we could get a bond hearing in two or three days. Um, and so kind of a one size fits all, and I don't know if the numbers have, you know, will bear this out, but it just seems like if you give someone more time to, to do a bond hearing, they're going to take more time to set it. Uh, and they're busy and they have other priorities. Um, and in the criminal context, I mean, we would think that, you know, a bond hearing uh, what, in a criminal context, you get it within 72 hours, right? You I mean, a, You have a statutory right to a bond hearing within a certain number of hours. Right, Small. and so, and, and the, the problem with this timeliness can't be overstated. You have taken someone who, uh, let's face it, they don't make a lot of money to start with. Uh, and you have just, at a minimum, they're going to spend three weeks waiting for a bond hearing. Uh, and even if they have a lawyer. Uh, so that's crippling to a family three weeks worth of earnings for this person that could have been spent on their rent or whatever else um, has just made a, a difficult situation more dire. So the, the timeliness of, you know, how do we get people in front of the judges to, you know, uh, have an opportunity to make that individualized determination. Um, and I'm sorry, they're yeah. giving us the past end signal, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to recap here, um, if I can. I'm not David Letterman, and these are not funny, um, but I, I think as I look at my notes that uh, I've identified 10 um, sort of top 10 suggestions for improvements to access to counsel, um, also not in priority order, but I'm going to call them out here and then invite people to join us and talk further. Um, after we conclude the panel. One is reconsider the location of detention facilities away from the remote rural areas and where that reconsideration is not possible, at least consult and plan better among the agencies for uh, coordination for the placement of judges uh, in or near those facilities. Number two, increased attention to alternatives to detention. Number three, increase legal orientation program so that there's funding for LOP for everyone. Uh, and a related point is remove obstacles to LOP in those places where it's available, not at government expense, for the Oakdale example. Um, number four, more live in-person hearings as opposed to televideo, particularly for merits hearings. Five, um, 
a need for funding for representation even after uh, or beyond the LOP context. We heard that, uh, so everybody gets LOP and you identify people with meritorious claims, how are those gonna be addressed and where's the funding for the uh, programs or the lawyers to represent them? Five, increased resources for immigration courts across the board so that the people are not waiting so long for their hearings and the judges have the resources they need to do a better job. Um, six, I touched on judges physically placed in the detention facilities. Seven, limited representation for bonds. Um, eight, through the CIR process, funding for appointed counsel for vulnerable populations, especially children and mentally ill or mentally disabled. Uh, nine, uh, reconsider the role of a better, stronger RNA program coupled with the anti-notario fraud effort. And 10, um, save money to pay for some of those other things by reducing federal criminal prosecutions for illegal entry or re-entry. Okay, so I think that's it, um, at least for my list. I want you to join me, please, in thanking all of the panelists for their uh, thoughts and contributions. <laughs> Ruthie? I think, I think that was almost as good as David Letterman. I almost couldn't tell the difference. Um, hi, thank you all, audience members and speakers. It's been an incredible day of conversation. More than just conversation though, we have really succeeded in bringing lessons learned from across the country in the dialogues, lessons on best practices and on strategy here to DC where policymakers, lawmakers and advocates work to make the change at the policy level that will, we hope, make a real difference to people on the ground. Changes that will bring policy into line with best practices, basic due process, and human rights standards, and in many cases, save taxpayer dollars. We look to the successes and best practices in the criminal justice system and correction system, not because immigration detention practices should be modeled on the correction system by any means, but because there's no reason for us to be reinventing the wheel. In the spirit of not presuming detention as a default, we started the day with an examination of models for alternatives to detention, looking at existing community-based programs, such as those piloted by LIRS, described by Brittany Nystrom, designed to provide individualized assistance to immigrants in removal proceedings, as well as ISAP-2, the formal ICE alternatives program provided by BI. Julie Myers-Wood reported that ISAP-2 costs just $8 per person per day, compared to $164 per person per day for detention, and leads to 96% compliance for final hearings and 84% compliance with removal orders. Tim Murray of the Pretrial Justice Institute noted the, quote, kinship between immigration detention reformers and pretrial services practitioners, and called for nimbleness in our responses to individual cases, not a one-size-fits-all approach to alternatives. Both Tim and Cliff Keenan of DC Pretrial Services and a federal prosecutor for almost two decades emphasize that it makes no sense to assume that one person's risk is identical to another's. Validated risk assessment is essential to make appropriate decisions about alternatives. The District of Columbia is able to release 90% of its pretrial population with reasonable compliance rates and rearrest rates in the single digits positive results similar to those we heard in our dialogues across the country, from programs implemented in New Orleans, Houston, Santa Clara County. Pretrial services administrators have developed expertise over decades that work for a diverse range of populations and the metrics to evaluate their effectiveness. Brittany and Julie both echoed the need for metrics to evaluate and improve alternatives to immigration detention. And Julie, who ran ICE under President Bush, posed a challenge can we find better ways to get compliance without detention? This theme was repeated throughout the day. I, and I know most of us in the room, would like to see the administration and Congress take it on. And to that end, I want to highlight the importance of the congressional bed mandate as we talk about detention reform. As a few of our speakers noted, including Gary Mead, head of enforcement and removal operations at ICE, the agency and some members of Congress interpret DHS appropriations language to mandate the agency to maintain and fill 34,000 beds on a daily basis. It precludes ICE officers from making decisions about detention based on the agency's priorities, policies, and need. 
Instead, in carrying out their professional responsibilities, they're faced with a number that effectively serves as a quota. The mandate also makes it impossible for ICE to actually create cost savings for taxpayers through more effective and appropriate use of alternatives to detention and alternative forms of detention. Julie flagged in her recommendations for immigration reform that ICE should have flexibility to make individualized determinations about detention. This bed mandate approach was flagged by several speakers, including Wade Henderson and Brittany Nystrom, and I will add myself to the list of, of people who find it problematic. We heard some strong calls for improved access to counsel from the lunchtime speakers. Wade Henderson noted the, quote, failure to execute the letter and spirit of Gideon v. Wainwright, even at its 50th anniversary, for both detained and non-detained immigrants. Julie Myers-Wood recommended that immigration reform look at a broader right to counsel for immigrants in removal proceedings. And Dr. Richard Land of the Southern Baptist Convention called counsel a, quote, basic right and proposed a domestic legal court to support legal education for people who will commit to pro bono work after graduation. The speakers in our final panel on council made clear the need for expanded LOP, easier access for attorneys to their detained clients, citing of detention facilities actually near to more than one or five immigration attorneys. Shout out to Ken and Jonathan. Um, and government appointed attorneys for children, people with mental disabilities, and other vulnerable populations. Legal information and counsel increased justice and also increased court efficiency. As Jonathan Ryan said after his kind of fantastic story, we need to decrease ob obstacles and increase incentives.